Uh, good evening, and thank you for joining our monthly ZWAC show Zoomcast, where we try to feature something new and interesting being done in the world of zero waste and resource recovery. And then we try to compare this new idea with the knowledge gained by the pioneers of zero waste. My name is John Moore. I'm a lawyer. I'm not a zero waste professional. Tonight, we look at the intersection of science and public policy. What makes good science? How is good science credibly presented to persuade and make good policy? Is the earth really flat? Do vaccines cause <laughs> autism? Is climate change real? Did humans have something to do with causing it? Should policy be made because a political majority believe in the truth of something or does scientific observance count for more? And how can we know if science is true when the public relations departments of businesses that are motivated by profit tell us so? Are the truth and fake news really two sides of the same coin? Tonight's interview is with Brian Bauer, the founder, president, and CEO of Resynergy, which is just up the road in Rohnert Park. Resynergy's website touts its modular pyrolysis process that heats plastic waste in a contained oxygen-free environment to make fuel. And it has a pilot project with Recology in Santa Rosa. So there's plenty of plastic waste in the world that's not doing any good. But is pyrolysis a good response to a real problem, or is this simply toxic incineration of trash under a different name? We hope to learn more. We paired this discussion of pyrolysis with an interview with one of the most accomplished zero waste pioneers, Dr. Paul Conant, whose PhD in chemistry and his science-based advocacy to oppose trash incinerators is legendary. A world traveler and human rights advocate, Dr. Conant was married in Eastern Nigeria in the then independent state of Biafra. He walked to Bangladesh in a muddy monsoon to try to rescue his wife who was jailed there as a political prisoner. He wrote the seminal book, The Zero Waste Solution and put a copy of his book into the hands of Pope Francis. And he is often quoted for saying, God recycles, the devil burns. <laughs> And with that, I, I turn it over to our director of the Recycling Archives, Susan Kinsella, who will be reading excerpts of her interview with Dr. Connor. Susan? Thank you. Um, well, I interviewed Paul Connett in October of 2021, and it was a wonderfully thrilling experience. He was born in England and has lived a most amazing life which John just uh, gave some summaries of. So I'm gonna jump to the um, next part about uh, the part of his life that I especially wanna talk about this evening is based on his background with a PhD in chemistry. For much of his work life, Paul taught science and chemistry at colleges and universities in both the US and England. So it was when he was hired to teach chemistry at St. Lawrence University in New York State in the mid 1980s, that he had a career changing conversation with the college librarian. Here's how he tells it. The college librarian said to me, Paul, you're a chemist. What do you know about the issue of incineration as in trash incineration? And I said, well, sounds like a good idea to me. I mean, you can get rid of all those dreadful landfills. We had about 20 landfills in the county. And I went on, this incinerator would be just one facility, not all those landfills. So you could tightly monitor the incinerator for emissions and you could create energy to boot. Well, you better read these papers, she said. And she gave me several papers written by Barry Commoner on dioxin and how it is created by burning mixed materials. And when I read those reports and essays, I got head over heels into the issues. I realized that the problems with garbage incineration were far deeper and much bigger and more systemic than I had expected. I was shocked by what Barry Commoner was writing about dioxins, incineration being a major source, and how the consultants hired to inform the public were lying when they said dioxins could be controlled. Well, that investigation morphed into Paul attending several conferences on dioxin in Europe and then collaborating on organizing the first citizens conference on dioxin in the US. His conference was intended to be an adjunct to a formal dioxin symposium in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. And originally Paul's conference was intended for environmental activists, 
but he managed to get some of the top government scientific researchers to speak at it as well. Here's how he did it. As Paul says, I got a call from George Lucier. George was the head of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. They're the best scientific body in the United States. The Institute is a government body, but not a regulatory body. They do research and they were often the co-organizers of international symposiums around the world. They're also the main organizer of the official Research Triangle Park Dioxin Conference. And George said, I hear you're organizing a second conference on dioxin at the same time as ours. And I said, yes, we are. He says, well, I was wondering whether or not you could, we could save you some work. We could give you a half day block of time at our conference and you could do all your presentations that afternoon. Well, that sounded very much like co-optation to me. So I played hard to get. I said, well, George, we put so much time and effort into organizing this conference. There was so much logistical planning and we've already booked the hotel. We've got 300 people registered. So George, why don't you talk at our conference? <clears throat> That's how we got some of the best dioxin scientists and experts to come and speak at our conference. They all gave absolutely fabulous talks. I think it was one of the best conferences combining science with activism that there's ever been. And of course, the large audience was full of people who were fighting hazardous waste and trash incinerators. So in the interview, um, I said to him, during my own recycling career, I did a lot of work on recycled paper and environmental paper issues. And dioxin was a big issue in paper making because it's formed when chlorine is used in the paper industry to bleach the wood fibers to make paper white. It was probably in the mid 1990s when I learned that EPA's internal scientists had declared among themselves that dioxin was the most carcinogenic material on the planet. Paul answers, yep. They complained that they were being prevented by their supervisors from ever announcing that to the public. And I wonder if that's still the case. Paul tells me, thanks for bringing that up. You're right. It was triggered by the paper industry. Their lobbyists were arguing that there's a threshold level for dioxins, so it could be regulated and still be okay to use chlorine to bleach paper. And that's why a reassessment must be done, they said. It was Linda Bur Birnbaum, who was in charge of the researchers who did that reassessment that the paper industry was calling for. And she found that dioxin was actually worse than they thought, not better. Not only was it carcinogenic, but it also interfered with fetal development and infant development because it disrupted endocrine function. Linda's reassessment was the birth of the endocrine disruption theory. Endocrine disruption by dioxins was justified by facts not speculation. And then Linda Birnbaum did a brilliant and courageous thing. She took all this infant and fetal development stuff about dioxins and endocrine disruptors and published it. She published her data and findings in the open literature because the EPA would not publish it. She did it for the citizens. She said, well, at least they can find out for themselves what the science says the dangers are. And that's how the EPA administrator's effort to suppress the information failed. So after talking with the librarian at St. Lawrence University and doing a lot of research on dioxin, Paul got into the fight against an incinerator in the local county. And here's what he says about his work with that. If you wanna shut down incinerators as a disposal option and you don't want more landfills, then expanding recycling in all its forms is necessary. During the St. Lawrence incinerator fight, I co-authored six papers on dioxin with Tom Webster, who was an expert on dioxins. And I thought, great. I joked that he was the brain and I was the mouth. And then I made 40 <laughs> videotapes with another professor at St. Lawrence. These videos featured everything from battles over incineration to the ash landfills where all the toxic stuff goes after burning. And some in that series highlighted the alternatives, recycling, composting, reuse, repair, and banning. As demand for public speaking ramped up, I combined teaching the chemistry of deadly toxic molecules with explaining the science behind the warnings. I loved giving these speaking engagements 
talk about giving your life meaning through good work. I've always loved teaching. I loved it. I, I love to make complicated things simple as best as I can. My pride and my joy is doing it for nothing but the sheer pleasure of making complicated things like dioxin understandable to ordinary citizens who hated chemistry. I say, look, the thing about chemicals is that the names are actually horrible. The names are what frighten people. Names like 2378 tetrachlorinated dibenzoparadioxin. I would say, when you hear a name like that, you say, help, let me out of here. And then I'd say, now I want to explain to you what that molecule is, what the building blocks are. All you need to know about how it's put together is this. And then I'd explain how dioxins form from simple molecular building blocks. Six carbon atoms linked in a ring with six hydrogens at the corners, that's benzene. Two rings connected make a biphenyl, add chlorine to get polychlorinated biphenyls, or we know them more commonly as PCBs, add an oxygen to make polychlorinated dibenzyl furans, and finally, add two oxygens to make polychlorinated biphenyl dioxins. Each stage creates more toxicity. At one point I thought, yeah, this is really totally unnecessary. There's no point in people knowing this. It doesn't do them any good. Until a neighbor heard me talk and she commented, you know, I hated chemistry in school, but hearing you explain the structure of dioxin, this was the first bit of organic chemistry I've ever understood please don't drop that chemistry lesson because it's so empowering. And that's when I understood that people need to be empowered by facts, by knowledge in order to be an activist. Meanwhile, the other side, the consultants paid to minimize risks from dioxin are putting people down all the time. Their message is, well, if you knew as much as I know about this machine, you would realize that there's nothing wrong with it. It's perfectly safe. And I'm afraid you're stupid. I'm brilliant, you're stupid. <laughs> and after some of their speeches, some citizens are left saying, he's so brilliant. I can't understand a word he's saying, but that must be because he's so brilliant. No, you can't understand because he's so inarticulate. If you think he's brilliant, then he should be explaining what he's talking about in ways you can understand. I used a lot of humor and that made me very popular as a speaker. I was not boring. I hate boring. After I gave my audiences the straight poop on dioxins and other scientific issues, I would tell them why these toxics had to be feared by letting them know what they do to the human body. They're such little things, I'd say, just molecules with chlorine and oxygen atoms clinging to benzene rings. So what's the real issue with dioxins? Well, the real issue of dioxin is even though it's fat soluble, the liver can't convert it into a water soluble byproduct so that the kidney can get rid of it. So there's only one place for dioxins to go, the fat. So they accumulate in our fatty tissues. And for a man, they accumulate for a lifetime in his fat, steadily increasing in concentration. But a woman has a way of getting rid of these toxic molecules, and that is by having a baby. Here she is consuming dioxin from her food for 20 odd years. And then when she's pregnant for nine months, those dioxins move from her body fat to the fetus. And oh my God, this means that the effective concentration of dioxin goes up astronomically when it reaches the fetus. It's not having much of an impact on the adult, but it has the potential of a huge impact on the fetus. And that is the story of why we should stop the production of dioxins by garbage burning. It's why our activists need this kind of information. It's what dioxins do to the fetus that should concern us most. And then in speeches, I can switch to the alternatives at last, reduce, reuse, recycle. Because incineration and landfilling get people alarmed. And then everybody goes through a metamorphosis where they start looking for alternatives. Incineration gets you to the alternatives fast because even if you made incineration safe, it, you'd never make it sensible. Burning destroys resources and value, creating a liability. Making dioxins while burning garbage is not a sensible way of disposing of discarded materials. You can see that visible switch going on in people's minds. 
people went in thinking that fighting incineration was a duty that you had to perform. It was going to be painful, putting your hand into the toilet of disgusting pollution and nasty stuff like burning in landfills. But often during the discussion of why reuse should go ahead of recycling, people sensed, ah, oh, we're talking about resources. We can create jobs with this. We can create small businesses. And then Paul adds another point. I also want to comment on Mary Lou Van Devender's big contribution to protecting the language recyclers use to describe their work. Using words inherited from the waste industry, like waste recycling, solid waste management, and municipal solid waste, made reuse, recycling, and composting seem worthless. She was saying things that resonated with anti-incinerator activists, like discard management, not solid waste management. And there's no such thing as waste. It's resources in the wrong place. And of course, she was appalled when waste managers and recyclers alike habitually used the term resource recovery when what they meant was destruction by burning. Wasting industries were pretending that they were recovering resources, but they were destroying them. So even though their incinerators generated some electricity, they ruined all the resources. A resource recovery facility was really a resource destruction facility and waste to energy was really waste of energy. The way you save the energy embodied in refined materials is to conserve it by reusing, recycling and composting. That's one of the big ways you can help save the planet from the threat of global warming and system collapse. Well, now there are so many wonderful stories in Paul's interview. I wish I could tell you all of them, but I'll close now for, for right now with one of the many hilarious triumphs that Paul described. <laughs> he said, when I was in Spain, Greenpeace asked me to go with them to the town of Almaden, which was the home of one of the world's largest mercury mines. This mine had been functioning since before Christ. But the mercury market was in trouble, so the mining company was desperate to diversify. They had a plan to build a commercial hazardous waste incinerator at this site. They intended to burn hazardous waste from all over Europe, and Greenpeace asked me to debate the chief engineer of this proposal. I said, fine, I'll do it. They said, well, we should warn you, though. The last time that we were there, the citizens chased us out of town because they see this factory as their future livelihood. So the chances are that you're gonna be pelted with tomatoes. So, so I am full of trepidation when I go to this town hall, but then I get to, into the funniest debate that you can imagine. My opponent is debate, debating in Spanish and Greenpeace is translating into English for me what he's arguing so I can respond. And then when I argued my side in English, somebody translated what I'm saying into Spanish for the Spanish audience. I could tell by these early exchanges that I'm getting more response than my opponent is and more laughter. So we get to the end of the debate and we get a delicious moment. A guy in the middle of the audience gets to his feet and he wanders to the front, pointing and waving his finger at me saying, you, you sound more like a priest than a scientist. And I thought, oh my goodness, I'm in a Catholic country. Do I dare say this? And I said, yes. So I got to my feet, gave this heckler the sign of the cross and said, that's right, my son, God recycles, the devil burns. And when this was translated, I was not lynched. The crowd loved it. The next time I went to Spain, Dolores, the Greenpeace activist who had hosted this meeting, met me at the airport. She had this big button on which said, God recycles, the devil burns in Spanish, and I've used it everywhere since. Yay. Hey, okay. thank you, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, <laughs> so, thank you for putting me into your memoir, Paul. I really appreciate that. <laughs> well, I, you, got, you, I got a lot of the inspiration from Dan, of course. Yeah. You, you two protected the language, you really did. Absolutely. So I am momentarily going to open the floor to questions for, for Paul, but I'm gonna take my moderator's prerogative and ask the first question, which is actually kind of a two-part question. I'm gonna ask it because you're sort of uniquely situated with your PhD in chemistry to talk about how one, how a layperson like all of us 
can tell between true science and false science and how true science can be communicated to be made into public policy. And to illustrate the, the problem, I'll go back three years to when we were in the early stages of the current pandemic, when it was pretty clear right away that this was something new that really nobody knew very much about. And then it sort of progressed that, well, some people kind of knew that there was likely to be exponential infection because we had an airborne pathogen, but they kind of suppressed that. And then as we got into the period where they were talking about how to handle this thing, there was a lot of conflict amongst the policymakers about what the science said and what they'd rather, what the people would rather hear. So Paul, as a, as a science-driven person trying to communicate scientific truth to make policy, how do, you, how do you communicate what the truth is to people like us? Well, it's a, these are very, very good questions. And obviously, I've been occupied with them for many years. Um, I think it helped me uh, with audiences for them to know I was not making a single cent out of this. I never made any money out of my involvement with waste and, and other issues I've been involved in. And that that made it a lot easier. And obviously, I had no hidden agenda. So that that is helpful. Um, science is nothing without truth. Absolutely nothing. And as soon as you play around uh, with machinations and public relations, as soon as you twist, you no longer have science. And unfortunately, I think most people are out there thinking in the world, the big bad world is the world of industry, which lies about science. It has a lot of money for PR and they can massage and make dioxin safe enough to put on your cornflakes. Um, we know that. What they don't realize, and sadly don't, perhaps it's good that they don't realize it because it's a sad truth, is that as well as the industry, government too is in the business of massaging science and hiding science from the truth. And that is very, very sad. In other words, not all the thugs wear black hats. Some thugs wear white coats uh, and work for government. And I'm talking now at the, uh, about another experience. I've had the experience of fighting incineration, uh, which it makes, it, People treat me very positively on that. And all my work on zero waste, I get very positive response to that. But I've also spent 26 years fighting fluoridation, deliberately adding a known toxic substance to the drinking water. And for 70 years, the US government has lied about this whole practice, this policy. And right now, they are more concerned about protecting this policy than they are protecting the brains of developing children. Now, I'm talking about protecting the brains of the fetus and of the nursing infant. Pregnant women are not being warned to avoid fluoride and parents are not being warned not to use fluoridated water to make up formula. The end result is that millions of children in the earliest years of their lives are being exposed to a neurotoxic substance a substance that lowers the IQ of children, increases the symptoms of ADHD. And you might think that this is just one side of the argument. May I say that this, what I've just told you, is based upon studies funded by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. And yes, indeed, the head of that agency from 2009 to 2019 is the person you referred to, uh, Linda Birnbaum who was such an ally on dioxin. She has turned out to be an ally for us on getting the truth out on fluoride. But um, so it's a very, very painful subject that we have people with the highest degrees. Um, and I, I mean, there, there's very few people that are innocent on this issue of fluoridation. Academics, useless by and large, have walked on the other side of the street, have they have not read the literature. Doctors and dentists do not read the literature. They take the word of their professional bodies and the government agencies at face value. Um, and the government agencies like the Center for Disease and Control is absolutely, utterly pathetic. And these are gentle words. Um, the Health and Human Services, the US Public Health Service, 
FDA, you name it. There are very few people in these agencies who are prepared to deal with the science or the truth on this on this issue. And so, so here's what I was trying to get to, Paul. Yeah. Okay. So I'm a parent. <laughs> yeah. I, I had I had to make a decision at some point to have my child drink fluoridated water. Not not that there's much else available, unless I want to buy plastic bottles. So I'm a lawyer, so I'm kind of a discerning person, but. How do I make an intelligent decision when, as you say, the, the powers that be are in favor of fluorid, fluoridize, fluoridation, and there's not a lot of science that I'm likely to be able to understand as a layperson that tells me they're wrong? How do I, how do I figure out the truth? This is a very, very good. This comes back to the whole notion of empowerment. Um, there are no shortcuts. When you're a, an activist, you must learn the facts, you've got to get on top of the issues that you're talking about. You've got to get on top of it. And, and a lot of citizens have, a lot of citizens know more about fluoride and its toxicity than many, many government officials and, and many, many scientists. So it's, you know, my teacher at school, my Latin teacher, he said, an educated person is someone who can entertain his or herself, entertain a friend, and entertain a new idea. And that's what we don't have in the American educational system, is this absolute determination to keep our children's minds open, open to facts. And also we've got to add to that the confidence of reading the literature themselves. I mean, there isn't much literature to read on this, um, John. There's not much literature. There's about four or five papers that they have to read. Um, and unfortunately, people are lazy. They don't want to do this. Um, they're intimidated. And the other side just specializes on embarrassing, intimidating people. I didn't want to get involved with the fluoridation issue when my wife asked me to do so because I was frightened that I would be seen as looney tunes by my fellow professors at St. Lawrence University. Um, but she was persuasive and I did look into it. But I was intimidated and most people are, have been intimidated by this massive public relations operation, which has operated for over 70 years. So you've got to break through intimidation. You've got to have the confidence to read the stuff for yourself and be careful of accepting authority. If you accept authority, then you're jumping back to Galileo and the Pope. Well, let me ask my final question, which follows that up. It's also true, and it also makes it a problem to learn the true science, knowing that science changes, science evolves. We, we will know more things a year from now than we know today. Yeah. So I imagine myself in 1880, and I've got the chicken pox, and my doctor comes to the house, and I say, doctor, what, what caused this? And he says something about miasmas, and the four humors of my body are out of balance. And that's all he can tell me. 15 years later, I asked the same question and the doctor says, well, this fellow in Germany figured out that there's little tiny creatures that you can't see with your eye that are causing it and we call them bacteria. But in 1880, the, the doctor wouldn't have been wrong. He just would have told me what the best available knowledge. How do you find out the truth when things change? Well, how I think how do I know there won't be research 10 years from now that says fluoridation is great for your health? Well, that, that would be that would be fine. If that, if that is the case, uh, it would still be have to be based upon the best science and, and one's willingness to read the literature and, and having having um, people like Linda Birnbaum and government agencies and scientists like the scientists now, Bruce Lanfear and Howard Hugh and others that are doing these studies, these studies financed by the NIEH. Um, but then there's also common sense. I mean, the, 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 and, and the way it's presented, this comes back to the whole notion of what Susan was reading about the dioxin. What was the significance about the dioxin? One of the giveaways that I experienced when I first started reading about fluoridation in 1996, 96, was the level of fluoride in mother's milk. It was extremely low, extremely low. And I said to myself, who knows more about what the baby needs, mother nature 
or the American Dental Association. I decided that Mother Nature knew that the baby didn't need fluoride, and that's why it wasn't in mother's milk. Now, run the clock forward to more recent times, and there is evidence that, first of all, there is no single reaction. There's no single molecule in the human body that needs fluoride to function properly. Nothing. There's no purpose for swallowing fluoride. There's nothing. On the other hand, we know that fluoride is very toxic for basic biochemistry, it interferes with enzymes, um, it interferes with G proteins and all kinds of things. So take this two facts. One, nature hasn't found a use for it in the human body. Number two, we know it's very toxic at a biochemical level. And yet we put it in the bloody drinking water of millions of Americans. This is it's insanity, insanity. Um, so there's a little bit of common sense here, but run the clock forward to the most recent science indicates that lower creatures like bacteria, bacteria and fungi have genes which produce proteins which go into the membranes and pump fluoride out of the water, out of the cells, pump it out of the cells. So nature is telling you she has these mechanisms to keep fluoride away from the basic biochemistry of the cell, pump it out. Now, that's when the citizen has to have a trust in their own judgment, their common sense, backed up with what they're told by people that don't have an obvious agenda. I'm not protecting a policy. I'm not being paid to do this. What they say is in the scientific literature. And, and John, very few places where I've given talks on this have I had an audience which doesn't come away opposed to fluoridation based upon what I'm able to present. The trouble is, you, I can't go everywhere in the world. I mean, I've been to New Zealand and Australia a dozen times on this and spoken in Parliament and everywhere else but you just don't have the audience. You don't have the media helping you. You don't have scientific bodies helping you. It's extremely frustrating and it's taken so long, but I do believe that we will win this. We will win this, which in court, we, we've taken the EPA to court um, under Tusker. Tusker, John, you would know this being a lawyer, the Toxic Substance Control Act allows citizens and groups to petition the EPA to ban the, the specific use of a chemical if you can show it harms people. Not only the mass of the people, but subsets, you know, vulnerable subsets of the population. And that's what we did. We started this process in 2016. We're now in court. We'll have a hearing in a few days' time. Uh, meanwhile, we have all these important studies which shows the fluoride lowers IQ, et cetera, published. Um, and I think we're going to win that case, which won't immediately end fluoridation overnight. But um, there's just one other thing I would say about this, and it goes to I don't have much trust in the regulatory agencies. Most of them have been captured. The EPA has been captured. The pesticide industry, the chemical industry, et cetera, have captured EPA's activities in, on most fronts. But there is one entity which is very important in the United States, and that is, and I've mentioned already, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, headed by George Lussier, I mentioned, uh, Linda Birnbaum and, and a couple of other very important people. These are. This is not a regulatory body. This is a research body. And one of its arms is the National Toxicology Program, which does systematic reviews on toxic substances. So also in 2016, our group, Florida Action Network, asked this NTP to do a systematic review of fluoride which they did, they spent five years on it and they got to a final, final review of fluoride's neurotoxicity, vindicating 
everything that we'd said, everything that we said is vindicated in this report. It was finalized. It was going to be published on May the 18th, 2022. And then the Health and Human Services, the Deputy Director of the Health and Human Services prevented that from being published. That's what I'm talking about. That ain't science. So you got the Deputy Director practicing politics, protecting policy, not protecting the health of the American people. That is not science. And this is supposed to be a, I'm, I'm getting upset here. This is supposed to be a scientific country, a technological country based upon science. But if your science is not truthful, if, if your whole public health services is not based on a firm foundation, if you put a wedge in bet between honest science and public health policy, there's going to be hell to pay. And I said that before COVID. Thank you, Paul. I want to turn it over to other people mm. to have questions. I, I know Mary Lou has her hand up and Neil had his hand up. So Mary Lou. Uh, Paul, one of the most interesting things uh, to change the subject a little bit. Uh, one of the most interesting things I ever heard you say was when you were fighting an incinerator in um, Los Angeles, uh, the incinerator as so often happens was being cited in a low income community where there were a lot of people of color and a whole lot of people were totally intimidated by the, the suits up on the stage. Um, and the suits were saying, well, you should believe this because I say so, and I have all this science behind me. And um, it's much too complex for you to understand. And you said to the people in the audience, if they cannot explain it to you in terms that you understand, you shouldn't believe them. Yeah. How do you, how do you, do you say that all the time to people? And how do you get people to trust their own uh, sense of uh, what's real and what's true? Well, I don't know how, I mean, I try, I try, and I don't know how successful I am in terms of the people I don't know and never see again, but I try and um, I just know it's important. I know it's very, very important. I mean, it is. it has been the joy of my life to put science, uh, to, to feel that I'm a consultant in the public interest, to put science in the public interest as opposed into the corporate interest and, in, and sadly in terms of the government interest in, in the cases I've been talking about. But um, we just need more people respectful, respectful of science, <clears throat> but, but not accepting <throat> secondhand authority. This is what's killing us, is secondhand authority and pumped up authority and public relations. I mean, I sometimes feel we're living in two different worlds. We live in the real world on the one hand, and we live in a world constructed by public um, <clears throat> re, uh, relations agencies. And I think that people, you know, all this today, misinformation, people don't know, do they? They don't know what to believe and, and who to believe. And, 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 and I have the same problem as, as, as you're talking about. I, I can't get on top of every single issue, every single controversial issue. Um, and so I tend to fight shy of being too outspoken on some, some issues. <clears throat> It's difficult. We want shortcuts. We want to believe in, in, in authorities. Um, and maybe um, uh, I, I maybe in the future, we will set up some authorities which we trust on things like science. So we have a, a science body. I haven't found one yet other than the, than the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Neil, did you have a question? Um, <clears throat> Uh, and, uh, I have uh, a, a couple of comments, if you don't mind. I won't be too long, I promise. Uh, first of all, uh, seeing Paul uh, speak and, and hearing him, uh, I'm rem reminded of so many uh, victories that we shared. Uh, I remember in Philadelphia, uh, <laughs> in, in, this, uh, in this theater, the city council is a real theater, Paul. You can confirm that with mezzanines and stuff, crowded and screaming and yelling. And Paul had the task of explaining to the 
the city council, of course, but the public assembled um, that uh, because the consultant had just answered a question uh, about lead, what happens to lead when it goes in, into the air? And um, <clears throat> uh, Paul uh, was, uh, I immediately, I was working for the city council. I said, Paul, could you address that? And he had the difficult task of explaining to people that when, uh, because the consultant said that when he, the lead went up, it never came down. <laughs> this was the famous bouncing. That is, wasn't lead. It was dioxin. This was the I'm famous, sorry, whatever. <laughs> famous bouncing dioxin molecules, which never landed on the ground. I mean, this is one of my real triumphs. There was this huge bloody tome that the consultant put out, and um, they have concluded. We have brought up the issue that the big issue for dioxin was not what you breathe. It was the food that you contaminated. And then when the people ate the food, they got far more dioxin than just breathing the air. But these consultants showed that in there, they calculated the dioxin from fish, uh, from tomatoes and homegrown vegetables and et cetera. And they said, well, the exposure through dioxin of uh, dioxin through the food chains and through inhalation was about the same. Now, I knew that was wrong. I knew that was wrong. And the key piece of information, Neil, was the deposition velocity of the particles. Mm -hmm. you now, what speed were the particles landing on the ground? on the vegetables, on the tomatoes, on the water. The faster the particles- The grass went, that the cows were eating. That exactly. The faster the particles were move, moving, the more food that would be contaminated in the growing season. I hope you can all understand that. So that <laughs> speed of those particles was very important. So I'm looking for the deposition velocity. I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. I can't find it. It's not mentioned in the narrative. And eventually I'm going through the bloody, um, the, the, all the, the, the appendix with, you know, pages, pages of the figure. And eventually I found this page, which came down to the fact that 99% of the particles had a deposition velocity of zero. They never bound, they never landed because they were given a reflection coefficient. And if you gave a reflection coefficient of one, you didn't land, you bounced. It was all bullshit, absolute bullshit. <laughs> but it was all hidden in this appendix. But we found it and we blew that guy out of the water. We, oh. we, we did end that. Um, uh, well, so, so many other things. I just want to uh, say this uh, for now. Um, uh, Paul had great help. One, what he said made sense, which goes a long way. And number two, uh, he had a propagandist, uh, Ellen Conant, who produced a newsletter that was, uh, uh, it was a tour de force. Tour de force, it educated us, it trained us, it told us what cities to run to. We had teams uh, running in and out. She, she, uh, she's a true heroine. And yeah. um, uh, the, finally, I'll say that Rick Anthony, who knows uh, how long ago, <laughs> uh, referred, for, uh, referred to Paul as the superstar because he is an entertainer. There's no question about it, a scientific community entertainer. And the, the key to his success, as with many of us, is that we can comprehend the general will. That is not the majority, but what is really good for people. And it turns out that common sense around science and everything else, po politics go directly to the source, talk to people in their communities, is the way to go. And it's just wonderful to see Paul doing all this. Thank Neil, you. Neil, I, I know you've got to go to another speaker. So very, very quickly, one other thing. It vindicates what you've just said, the common sense. The common sense of the people of Philadelphia. Those consultants completely shot themselves on the foot because what they said was the dioxin emissions from this incinerator in South Philadelphia was no more dangerous than smoking two cigarettes in a life. <laughs> And the, the councillors just would not believe that. They thought that was ridiculous and they were absolutely right. So common sense sometimes overrides. If, 
if I may uh, talk for a, a, a bit more, there was an anecdote. Uh, <laughs> one of the key things, it was a racial issue because the city was, was uh, predominantly black. The Italians in this small enclave in South Philly were white. There was incredible tension. You may remember the Rizzo days. And, um, but the blacks were on the same side as the whites because the blacks didn't want the incinerator and the whites didn't. So the, the tension and there was the leader of the, the blacks, uh, of the black coalitions were city council people. And there was also a white city council. Verna was her last name, Italian from the south, Southern part. And she had a beehive hairdo blonde, uh, I don't know, I think it was called Beehive, all up, up, and the the consultants were so stupid, they referred to the plant in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, as, as they, go there, this is it, it works, go see. So Miss Verna goes there, of course, and soot starts falling into <laughs> her hair. And they were, I swear, <laughs> they had pictures of this, and she comes back to her Philadelphia hometown, South Philly, and it was it was common sense. Um, uh, it was a great victory <laughs> for common sense. Uh, all I can say, uh, mm. it was quite a story. And I must say, in in LA, there were five incinerators proposed. This was happening all over the country, all because mm. there were three hundred fifty. Every city, major population base in the country had a garbage proposal, uh, incineration proposal. You, Neil, I, I've got a. We we have another speaker. I'm so sorry. Speaker. Excuse me. Um, Dan had a question and then I'm going to move on. It's not really a question. I just wanted to say that one of the best ways to put this kind of information across requires that you make friends with someone who's a politically minded uh, artist or graphic designer. I had the privilege of doing that many times with both Mar Mark Gorell and his wife, Nancy Gorell. Nancy Gorell did one of the best illustrations I've ever seen of the very complex and hard to understand concept that recyclers deserve a disposal service fee. She, she did a cartoon where the recycler was Recycle Ella and Recycle Ella is standing there trying to recycle things and she's, she's poor little thing. She's looking at these bad sisters. The bad sisters are smoking cigars and they're <laughs> they, they've got bags of money. They've got bags of money in their hands, and they're the waste people. And they're saying, "You have to take care of yourself." Well, that's what we were getting from the garbage people when we said, "We're disposing of things just like you do, the garbage guys. Why aren't we getting paid a hundred dollars a ton for everything that we recycle?" Well, that's because you know you should just be making it by selling whatever it is. Well, that works fine until you start handling things like plant debris. Plant debris has no particular value until you do something to it. Mm -hmm. And that takes a lot of money and a lot of capital. So you can't do it without a disposal service fee. Well, you don't, you don't get to use the word disposal. It's written up in too many regulations and we get to use disposal any way we want and you can't use it at all and you can't have it. And our illustrators explained that to people. The other thing that we did was we explained what zero waste looks like when you take a 10 acre site and make it into a zero waste transfer station. And Mark Gorell was in, incredibly good at doing that yeah. and was a secret of our success many, many times as we went forward with, uh, with high volume recycling. That's all I wanted to say. Well, keeping it short and simple is always an important tool. Uh, are, are there any, does anybody else have a question? Thank you, John. Before we move on. There was thank just you, John, one... and thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. There's just one sentence which I think really underlines what Neil was saying, and that is what I learned in our battle stopping over 300 incinerators, is a threatened community is a strengthened community, has the potential to be strengthened. He mentioned Philadelphia, black and whites together. I saw the same thing in Londonderry, where the only thing that those two communities agreed upon was stopping DuPont building a hazardous waste incinerator. And, and they had one glorious moment where all the factions in Londonderry came together in the central square to oppose the incinerator. Um, so a th 
a threatened community can be a strengthened community if people work together. Thank you, Dr. Connor. So I want to introduce uh, Brian Bauer, who has been patient. We, we, we told him he would be talking at 6, uh, but it's 6.20. So thank you, Brian, for joining us tonight. Brian is the uh, president, founder, and CEO of Resynergy, which is located in Rohnert Park and has a project in Santa Rosa, which he's going to talk about in a moment. Um, I'm, I'm happy that he was willing to talk tonight. This is not necessarily an audience of people who warm to the idea of heating up plastic and making fuel out of it, but I'm always interested in how different businesses work. And we had talked before in the, on this show about pyrolysis and nobody really knew that much about the goods and bads of it. So I appreciate your billing willing to, to come on board and talk about it. So um, why don't you start by telling us what Resynergy is doing and what your pilot project is? And you have to unmute. And I have nine minutes. I can, I can do a concise version, but uh, yeah. So basically a little bit of history. Um, I studied at Stanford engineering, some of the leaders in small scale energy systems, new energy systems, and I thought, I would really like to do alternative energy. And this was 40 years ago, back when I met Mr. Steven Lautza. And um, so we, we uh, he actually went into earth sciences, which is, it could directly apply to um, environmental stuff. I said, I gotta do something more practical as a first generation college person. And I just did mechanical engineering. They said, you cannot do alternative energy. It will be years before there's anything. Um, that's that's fruitful for a, a student graduating. And so it actually took 25, 30 years of telecom experience and before I was able to come back into energy. And actually this is more of a plastics recycling thing that we're doing rather than a um, an energy thing. Although the products are energy and the products are more recycling, um, it's about collecting and help collecting and, and sorting plastic. Um, so in a nutshell, what we do is we take waste plastics, number two, four, and five, they're the additional plastics that 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 add in their, their molecular structure in a much more uh, uniform way than more the complex number ones, threes, and sixes. Um, and we, we break those down. And as you know, the three through sevens are mostly landfill and even a good portion of the twos and even a good portion of the ones. But we focus on the two fours and fives um, and we use a, a process very different from others in pyrolysis. We use microwave to heat. So our process is very fast. So we're 50 to 100 times faster our process than traditional pyrolysis. It makes us much more efficient. We use a lot less energy. And one thing that's really important is, as you all know, is keeping the oxygen out because the, the definition of burn is and combustion is heating in the presence of oxygen. So we go through great lengths to, to not have oxygen present. So um, in our process, we also have a catalyst uh, in a secondary stage, and that allows us to have our temperatures lower than others that would do fast pyrolysis, because with we are able to break down in a secondary stage um, the molecules in, into shorter chains with this secondary stage of catalyst. And the catalyst is like a catalytic converter. Um, it's what you have in your cars and, and it, it's coated with the proper catalyst to give you the liquid you want. And we're talking about fuel here, but primarily our goal is, is to make pyrolysis oil that gets recycled into pure plastic. And so that's an, an infinite, uh, potential to be able to, to recycle plastic forever. It's, it's not like mechanical recycling where you only have so many cycles that you can do. Um, so one of the things, one of the themes here I've heard is, is being really open with data and really sharing data. And I see Liz join, which is fantastic. Uh, we have a zero waste local task force in Sonoma County. And, and our approach is to share as much data as we can. And when there's different visitors with different technologies, we look at the, the what what's really coming out in emissions, whether it's byproducts or the emissions the and the gases, and I think that's so key. Um, there's so there's not every pyrolysis is the same, so depending on how you, how you take the feedstock, how you heat, 
and, and how you flare or deal with your post gases, their pyrolysis efforts and, and approaches are very different. So for example, if you were to, to take, if you were, what we do is a, a decentralized local community sort of decentralized deployment. So we put our process real close to where the plastic are, plastic is. So we are, we're at hubs and those hubs mean that we don't have to transport our plastic very far. Um, so is redu there's reduced uh, greenhouse gases from the transportation. Um, if you're using solar or wind for your electricity, that's much less. There are people out there still using coal and wood and other gases that are very um, wasteful and dirty. Uh, talk about dioxins. Yeah, so there's still people in the world who do that for pyrolysis. So if you go through the whole chain of, of how you can deploy pyrolysis, some, some deployments are much cleaner. So, so we just deal with our portion of it in the middle, which is the processing. And that, that's like I said, that's where we, we purge very, very well with nitrogen to make sure there's no oxygen present. Um, that's very difficult when you do like biomass pyrolysis, that's, uh, but you can do that kind of control with the plastic. Um, so what we do is we've been sharing our data and what we highly encourage any deployment is to, to look at the emissions and look at this, look at the dioxins, uh, the, the NOxes are really, really low with our approach of, of, of our off-date gases. Um, we, we've teamed with a company um, that does a this really next generation uh, generator so that, you know, there's, there's generation four generators today that are considered fairly clean. Um, but what we're using is one that's a linear generator and the NOxes are far less than traditional generators. And when you circle that back into power of the system, which is one of the options we have, uh, it's incredible. It, it knocks out any of the greenhouse gases that would have been used to power the system. So on net, um, and we keep sharing this data as we update it, for fuel, which again is not our main focus, but for fuel, we, we are a 60% greenhouse gas reduction uh, for the production of fuel. Now, we're not going to be able to solve the world's problems on, on internal combustion engines and get rid of that. But our part of this whole equation is cleaning plastic, recycling plastic, and in some cases it's fuel, in some cases it's, it's recycling the plastic. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's really about sharing the data, the byproducts, as well as the um, the, the main gas products, and, and then also even looking at the fuel in the fuel case, where we have zero sulfur. I mean, it really depends on the feedstock, um, which is another topic, but the feedstock is is typically hydrocarbons. It, it comes, the plastics come from um, refined oil in the first place. So we don't have sulfurs. So the NOxes, SOxes are essentially nothing. Um, and so it's, it's so different from incineration. And we are happy to share that data over and over again. Uh, and, and again, it's every pyrolysis is different. So we, we very much welcome um, looking at this data. Um, the, other, the other thing I like to emphasize a ton is our decentralized local community approach. Um, we look at SB54 very closely. And the, the key, key parts of that is um, being very healthy for the community, being very um, safe from hazardous waste, um, and the greenhouse gases and the, the climate are so critical. So again, I talk about that data on the greenhouse gases, but from a community standpoint, when you decentralize like this, you don't have these big traditional corporate plants that are emitting huge amounts of gases um, into neighborhoods. And you have much cleaner gases in a much smaller scale. So you know, if you were very close to one of these plants, um, it would be very little um, impact. It's, it's, it's similar to our five ton per day units. So what we do is we do four, four reactors on a 40 foot skid, which is the same size as the back of a truck. Um, there's five tons per day that are processed per module. Those can go into any warehouse, an industrial zone, and the emissions on that are less than a, the truck emissions of like a semi truck. So like a semi truck driving down the road will have more emissions than our system. 
So it just gives you a reference. And this data we will share over and over again. And it's, it's all about being very open. So I, yeah, I can't emphasize enough that how, how local we are to the Bay Area. Um, the technologists are here. And then one other thing that's, I guess, somewhat local, but one of the largest AI machine learning companies in the world has been working really closely with us and, and granting a project where we're looking at all the different feedstocks that could come into our system. So what people are realizing is what goes in highly impacts what goes out. I mean, that's, and, and so the chlorine going in, that's critical. The oxygen going in is critical to minimize that. Um, so we're looking at different kinds of feedstocks. So the initial rollouts that we'll have will be focusing on known feedstocks like industrial waste. So injection molders, they have two, three, seven percent waste. And those injection molded parts are really well known what's on there. Now, post-consumer waste, that can be different. So we're characterizing a lot of uh, films. Films is a big deal for these um, for for waste, as you know, that's very little of that is is recycled. Um, we're doing a project where, with Recology where we're looking at films, and with this this AI machine learning company as well, and just highly characterizing that. So th th there's a lot there. I'm just trying to cram a lot in a short amount of discussion time here and make sure there's enough time for for questions. But in a nutshell, how our pyrolysis is different, we use a very fast microwave-based pyrolysis, it's super efficient, eliminates the oxygen, is, is very clean, and can be simply localized. So what Steve and I have talked about is how can we characterize this, because this is so different than the traditional approaches of incineration, big scale, and the initial pyrolysis, big scale, and it wasn't well controlled. Um, how can where can we come up with a good name for for this type of approach? So um, looking for people with history like yourselves to, to, on, on some of these fronts and 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 frankly, to challenge what we're doing. we We want to be a very good local partner and center open the floor. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to come back to the sharing data part in a moment, but I wanted to make sure conceptually I. I've got in mind the instructors. Yeah. But the, if you live here at least. Yeah. Who's talking? Well, as far as I know, it's in California. It's only there temporarily. Thanks, Julie. Okay. So from looking at your website, from reading interviews with you, what it sent, there's input and there's output. So the input, the feedstock is plastic of different types. Of course, it matters where you get it from, how far it comes, how clean it is, what it is. It goes into what you call a reactor, which I would call a, a microwave oven because it's heated with microwaves. It's very fancy. You put the plastic in, you zap it kind of like you would a frozen pizza in a microwave. Something happens and there's separate. Your camera's ready. Probably good for a sandwich. I'm sorry, Julie? Oh. Okay. She's muted now. Yeah. So it's, it separates into, after you zap it, it separates into solids and gases and liquids. And presumably something happens with the gases that don't go out into the atmosphere. The liquids and the solids come out of the box, something happens to them. Is that reasonably close to what we're talking about? It's very good, yes. So when, when I put a bowl of frozen peas in my microwave, they don't heat evenly. I have to take them out and stir them up to get it heated. Does your, your fancy box do that? So yes, I'm sorry. So you weren't, that part of it, you weren't very accurate. But uh, yeah, so what do we do is the interesting thing about plastic, if you look at it, it's, it's something called, it's a, called a lost tangent in the microwave world. And that's how well the, the, the material absorbs heat. And plastic is terrible. It doesn't absorb heat at all. So what we do, if you can look at our patent online, um, our microwave is absorbed by silicon car carbide balls. So like silicon carbide is used um, in semiconductors for moving heat. So it's a fantastic heat conductor. And at the same time, it has a great loss tangent for, for absorbing microwave. So immediately, like, like our competing technology or competitors, whatever, they use like band heaters and 
all kinds of different heaters on the outside of a reactor and they try to get that heat through a wall into the plastic. So what happens is they've got to fight those walls and terrible conduction of plastic. And so they have a lot of losses. So they're, they're very inefficient the way they do it. Um, alternatively, what we do with the microwave is the microwave goes through the walls of a, a sleeve and it goes, it penetrates like in the microwave oven, penetrates deep into the material. So deep into, well, a deep, being an inch into the, um, the silicon kyber balls. So they quickly heat up and transfer heat amongst themselves. And then we have a really great mixing method. So we're mixing those balls mechanically at the same time they get really good microwave mixing. So we have like 15 microwaves, it's like 15 home microwaves, a little bit bigger than those, um, that are very well dispersed. The RF energy is well dispersed in those balls. And then a really good mixing, uh, very fast mixing of those balls. The plastic drops into that. So it's granulated plastic that drops into the top of that. And it's really, really well mixed. So what we do so much better than others is the plastic, any speck of plastic gets processed very quickly as it hits the balls and gasifies and goes through the system. Others are have this big mix of plastic and, and it's a, a vat of plastic that does not get good uniform heating basically. So that's our big difference and we can do that very quickly. So you have a better microwave oven than your competitors, but did, did I hear you say that the plastic is granulated so it's shredded before it goes into the- Yes, into the, correct. The box? Yes. Okay, so what comes out of the box? So what comes out of our, our system or the, the reactor? The reactor. So out of the reactor comes gases. So they're, 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 the molecular chains are shortened really well, much better because of this process than, than our competitors would do. So the, the gases come out and then they go through a, catalyt, uh, a, a catalyst, which looks like, a, like I mentioned, a catalytic converter honeycomb type of thing. So it goes through that and is broken down further into what we target. So we we can target diesel, we can uh, target aviation fuel, and we can target gasoline, or very, very simple breakdown is targeting pie oil. And our goal is to produce a lot of pie oil, which is used for chemical recycling. That's our primary target right now. And these same systems, uh, with an additional catalyst, we're looking at adding that right now. These can produce hydrogen and very pure carbon. So the pure carbon can be used in graphene and other applications, or it can be sequestered. Um, but this really pure carbon, you, you don't want to sequester it because it's got so much value, but some of it you would. Um, so what we're going to have is a, a, a bunch of systems out there that are doing chemical recycling. But at the same time, uh, whatever percentage is a very flexible system can be converted to make hydrogen. So some percentage can be switched or we just expand the number of modules out. Yeah. So some people on this Zoom might say, well, that's all great. But if you're, if you're trying to recycle plastic, which is not an easy thing to begin with, you're sort of perpetuating the need to make plastic, which a lot of people on this call don't, don't think is such a good thing. And then when you, when you add the the possibility and risk of, of, of community pollutants with which maybe your box doesn't doesn't have, it makes it, it 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 looks bad. So what do you say to the people who think we shouldn't be recycling plastic? We should be banning plastic. Yeah. So I am. It, this is this is an everybody sort of collaboration on plastic. So SB fifty four is a great effort. It doesn't. Nobody's happy with this. It. Kind of like the Obama administration. Nobody was happy with Obama. It must mean he was right down the middle somewhere. Um, sort of that's the way with SB 54, but I think it, it goes really far in its, its meaning. I think it's, it means really well. It's protecting local communities, and then it's going very far towards reducing plastic. And I think they use a lot that I got this. You can't see it, but it's a Pew Research wedge. I don't know how many people are familiar with that. But that's, it's a new way of looking at the recycling pyramid. And if, instead of having the reduce, reuse, recycle and having like five categories in the pyramid, it's broken that down into uh, like 12 different categories. So in reduce, it's about four, it's, it's, it's eliminate, 
reuse, reuse, and different kinds of reuse. But but we are very much proponents of reducing the use of plastic um, and then mechanical recycling wherever you can. Uh, but so many things still get um, they get incinerated or they get landfill, and we can help with a lot of that. And because this is profitable. I mean, it, it, we're, it makes it possible to do ocean cleanup so we can motivate different people all over the world to clean more important than oceans actually is rivers, river mouths or upstream of rivers. I call it like a plastic watershed. It keeps plastic out of the ocean um, because most plastic is going to the ocean via rivers. So it's just a big collaboration and we are actually only a small part of it. Um, we may be 5% or less in this um, Pew Research um, recycling triangle or pyramid, uh, but we think we, we're looking on the lower part of helping things on the incineration and the landfill and processing that. We're not trying to take from the, the we're not trying to add to, to more plastic or take from what the mechanical guys would be doing. We, we want them as much mechanical as possible. So going back to the shared data, do you have data that you share concerning your inputs and your outputs? Yes, yes, yes. Where, where do you share that? Um, I, in our groups, our, our local task force present that and uh, Liz has copies of it. And as we, we get our new version out, that we'll, we'll share that again. But I can, I can send that same um, document. And, and then of course your the the mission the, the box itself is patented, I assume. So there's a public record of what it does and how it does it. Um not yet. So when we have our first sites turned up, yeah, there's a there should be a public record of that. Yeah. Do did you have to get any permits for your facility? Yes, yes. So did you have to go, did you have to go through CEQA? Uh, did not go through CEQA through these first ones, but we're 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 working with uh, AQMD right now. Um, interesting enough, AQMD has looked at our data a ton, um, and we we shared with them all that we're doing for fuel, and then all that we're doing for um, repolymerization for the chemical recycling. And basically, their their response is a good one. Um, they can see the benefits of reducing greenhouse gases for fuel, but but we're all working so hard to reduce internal combustion engines, and and not promoting uh, fossil fuels for that kind of application. So it's really hard to to message out and and promote anything that that does this. So I, I actually commend them for. For that, but then they look real closely. The same thing. There's a the 68% reduction in greenhouse gases for make remaking plastic versus traditional ways of making plastic. We have a nice letter from them that 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 uh, promotes what we're doing. Yeah. Which agency was that? I'm sorry. Uh, Air quality management district. Okay. okay. So, well, how how did you avoid CEQA? Oh, we just haven't had big deployments yet. Yeah, okay. we expect to work with them quite a bit. So we've we've have um we've come up in advance. We have really extensive like environmental impact report data. So as we as we open those plants and and apply for that, yeah, we expect to work with them a lot. Yeah. So when I was looking at your website, and mindful it might not be the most current, it looked to me like primarily. You were taking the plastic and making diesel fuel fuel out of it, plus a small percentage of naphtha. Was I, am I mistaken about that? Yes, uh, that's a <laughs> we that website. If you look at, it, is almost three years old. Yeah, okay. yeah. So how how has it changed since then? Uh, our focus is on the pile for chemical recycling. Yeah, so there's this huge demand for that. The price is not as high, but it's it's. That's where the world would like to go, and that's where we'd like to go. So you're kind of out of the diesel fuel business? Yeah, I wouldn't say 100%, but yeah, it's not our main focus. Okay. No, this is before we have real big deployments, or when I say big as multiple, because they're all small. 
the, the hour is starting to grow late, so I'm thinking I would, I'd like to turn this over to questions from the audience, if that's yep. all right with you. And I, I urge everybody to be polite. We all may have different views, but we can be polite about it. No, I'll be pretty quick so we can get through all the questions now. Yeah. Mary, Mary Lou? Well, uh, first thing, I wanted to thank you very much for bringing up uh, the uh, the three R's and, and the pyramid, because I just asked Bonnie Bett to uh, send out the invite for this meeting, I just sent her a copy, a PDF copy of a slideshow I did about uh, entropy and how come entropy rules the three R's. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Why is reduce at the top of the pyramid and then re reuse and then recycle? And uh, it's only seven slides, but uh, that will answer the question about uh, what does entropy have to do with it? Um, Hmm. So th this is all the same yeah. reduce, reuse, recycles. It's all the same general categories, but this is the Pew Research where they break it into a lot more categories. But go ahead. And, you know. Mismanaged. Yeah, we would call that waste. Yes. <laughs> Can you share this? Uh, yes. Yeah, or this is from your slideshow, I guess. It's from some slides. Yeah, but I, yeah. Yeah, I could share this. Okay. Well, I get, and, and we can go look for the Pew Research one too. Um, uh, so, one of the primary goals of uh, the whole recycling enterprise, the, the reduce, reuse, recycle, uh, reuse and recycling of businesses, the primary purpose is to conserve material resources and energy. So, conserving the material resources, we have things that have been manufactured. We have, say, some plastics that have been manufactured. It's taken a huge amount of energy to get the uh, petroleum out of the ground or the gas or the gas and petroleum or whatever it was used to make the plastics. It's a huge energy intensive industry to make the plastics. And yeah. now you've got a huge energy intensive uh, recovery effort. Why not just scrub the whole thing and not make the plastics out of uh, fossil fuels, which are in the end stored solar energy that's been buried in the ground. Why not just use current solar energy to work with bamboo fibers or something like that. Uh, why bother? This is not a conservative uh, approach to managing discarded resources. Yeah, so I think it's a good idea to use other materials. Um, as you can see here, we are we need a small part of this overall equation and actually working to address some of the things down here that are still large landfill incineration. But it actually, if you look at cogeneration, um, the the new gener new linear generators that exist, they are actually super efficient, and that's enough. The gases that come off of, our, off of our system, instead of flaring, those gases are enough to completely power our system. So it's not really energy intensive. So it's so different than pyrolysis, say five ten years ago. Um, we can run the system without any extra resources, um, and. And then, like I said, that you can run, you can run this system. You can run this system with the energy that's already embodied in the project products you are recovering. Correct, correct. And and the greenhouse gas is compared to today, like you said, like like the drilling and refining is so intensive. Uh, we're sixty eight sixty to sixty eight percent less of greenhouse gases, and and zero energy. So it, it actually, when you include that energy savings, it's it's even better than the 60, 68 percent. It's it's we're we're that's the new data that we're going to come out with. It's 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 more like in the 80 percent range. Well, okay. So Bunny, can you take that, the picture down? Sorry. So oh, can so, see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, sure. it's, so it's so efficient that but Oh, shoot. I had a question. It escaped my mind. Sorry. Sorry. I'll also move. Dan, did you have a question? You're muted. Dan, you're muted. Taking a look at the wedge analysis, uh, I quickly noted that, remember back a little bit ago, I said something about the word disposal. Um, you've used, the, whoever did this graphic, has used the word disposal as a synonym for wasting. That's common in the waste industry. 
And that is again why the waste people have resisted giving recycle any time they have control, they will generally tend to resist allowing recyclers to call to say that they're in the disposal business, mm -hmm. which we are, or to get uh, paid for the service of disposal, which we do. So they really skew everything. They skew the economics in favor of wasting. Now that's that's a big chunk of what you've got in this wedge analysis. And then down below that, you have mismanaged. Well, that seems to me to be another uh, another synonym for wasting. So what you've got with this yeah. wedge analysis is that half of everything that goes in comes out as waste. And But it's not called that. Instead, it's called dispose and mismanage. I would call that greenwashing. Is there, does anybody else have oh, a we'll question have to. for Brian? Yes. I can't see the screen. Paul? Paul? Yes. Paul Connett. Yeah. Yes, I, I have actually three three concerns. Um, one, the business of plastics, you have, have thousands, literally thousands of additives, some of which are very toxic, metals like beryllium, uh, lead, and so on. Why are... I assume if you're making diesel fuel, those elements which cannot be destroyed, regardless of the efficiency of your system, those mm -hmm. elements, those toxic elements will be in the diesel fuel and eventually into the lungs of the people somewhere in the world. That's the first concern. The second concern I have is any high temperature process, whether it's incineration or gasification or pyrolysis, produces nanoparticles. You literally convert huge masses of material into trillions of tiny particles. And those tiny particles are very frightening indeed because they are so small, they evade your air pollution control equipment by and large, and they penetrate every membrane in the human body, starting with the lung membrane. So, uh, you have a system when you use high temperature process to deal with massive material, you have the potential of putting very toxic substances into every tissue in the human body. And uh, just to give you a frightening example. Well, well let's turn that into a question, Paul. Yeah. Okay, can. so what about nanoparticles? Yeah, so we, we keep our system um, pretty darn tight and actually would welcome a visit and some feedback on it. Um, and to, I guess to the first part of that, the, the beryllium and other heavy metals, um, that's why our first stage is really focused quite heavily on um, post-industrial streams, things that are known, um, injection molding parts that are polypropylene that, that we know what the makeup is. So we're, we're minimizing some of those, those additives and, um, and we'll know from them what was in there. Um, the the actual um, when when you look at heavy metals and chlorine and other things, we're working real closely with people who um, the absorbent people, uh, absorbents who they we process do a, a separate step. And this is when we want to maximize all the plastics going in. Um, we're working with the leaders in the absorbent world, so that actually pulls out. You probably know this better than I do. Um, those those not so pleasant um, heavy metals and the nanoparticles. Nanoparticles. Um, we have a pretty tight system as far as what goes in, and and when we when we keep the oxygen out, we purge the oxygen. The, our whole system has to be very very tight. So you're you know when we we by the time we have liquids, everything's in a liquid state. And the gases are pretty well controlled. We want to, to save all those gases. Um, yeah, and I, I would welcome a discussion on that. I, I want to be sure that we're, we're safe. One of the things I've advocated in any new process like this, whether it's incineration or pyrolysis, is that you monitor, your company would monitor the ambient air in the community in which you're located, and you would monitor nanoparticles. The concern is there's a relationship found in Montreal 
between the number of nanoparticles in the urban air and brain cancer. Mm -hmm. So um, it's obvious that the, the researchers there were able to monitor nanoparticles in urban air. Would your company finance such an operation? We'd be really interested. Yeah, uh, as far as monitoring, yes. So our our chief chemist, uh, young, young CTO, uh, he studied just this, these plastics. His biggest concern in the world is, is microplastics and nanoparticles. So it's it, in, with um, two of the Silicon Valley, I mean, these are very new. These are not your traditional oil and gas people for sure. But these these companies are helping fund some of our research or are aiming with him to, to add really tight monitoring, both on the incoming plastics, because that's so important, and on the, the, the gases and the output. Yeah, but I'm talking about the, the, the urban air itself. So that if you've measured nanoparticles in the urban air before you go into operation, and then you measure them after you go into operation, and there's an increase, then I think the community has the right to shut you down. That's an excellent, that's what, exactly what we should be doing. I agree. Excellent. And, and just lastly, I, I agree with, um, with Mary Lou uh, about the embedded energy. An enormous amount of energy has gone into extraction of oil, transport of oil around the world, energy into manufacture, then energy into more transport. Um, that energy does not get recovered when you burn right. something or you pyrolyze it. Uh, you do recover it if you recycle or reuse these objects, but not if you destroy them, not if you pyrolyze them or um, unless the pyrolysis is into recycling, then you will get some of that energy back. But into diesel fuel, for example, you have lost that embedded energy. Yeah, so that's why, that's, largely that's why we're focusing more on recycling. Um, but if you were to just go back and just look at the, the fuel, um, it is far less of a resource strain and much cleaner than the way people um, make diesel and use diesel today. Not, yeah, I'm not saying that's a great path to go down, but it is cleaner and less resource intensive than what's done today. Because it is, it's very, very intensive. Steve, did you have a question? And you're muted there. Yeah, um, it's not so much of a question as uh, my experience. And uh, well, first of all, I would say, uh, you know, I salute all of the heroes that are on the on the on the this in this group tonight that helped stop 300 incinerators, uh, mass incinerators in the United States. Um, that was critical work. And I, I the, the raw the raw message was don't burn it, recycle it. But fast forward to now, we have. Mechanical recycling of plastic at under stuck at under 10%. Um, also, in my work in Oakland, I feel that many, many uh, guys in suits coming in wanted pitching pyrolysis around 2010, give or take, telling me they could take anything I had and make magic, magic beans out of it with no emissions. And I asked them to come back, you know, with proof. And they, they, ne I never heard from them again. So when I heard for, heard from Brian. Uh, that he was doing pyrolysis. I said, you know, you're going to meet resistance in the recycling community. I didn't know he was going to be on stage tonight. And I thank John for, for doing that. But I, I do think that this approach, which is decentralized, modular, contained microwaves, it's, it's a more interesting approach than the highly capitalized mixed material, um, take all the material, you know, from a garbage company kind of schemes. And so um, I think he's done a lot of good thinking. I'm not doing a full-throated endorsement. I need, want to see the technology myself. But I think if you can't, if, if it's difficult to, to recover and mechanically recycle plastic and, and, and you look at this approach, I think there's a lot of interesting aspects to it. So yeah. I just want to say that we we really complement the mechanical recycling because I think when people realize there really is a way to recycle twos, fours, and fives, that will complement greatly the the one and twos work that the mechanical recycling people are doing, and the communities, everybody will be collecting better and sorting better and actually be more involved. There's 
I mean, the reason SB 54 is out there is because people have no trust in the promises of recycling. And we need to change that. So we need to build that. And so we can work really well with improving mechanical recycling, but there still will be a lot of things that can't be mechanically recycled or or demands for pure uh, plastic and, and we can provide that. And again, if you look at the 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 new pyramid that Pew has, and we're a small part of it, but um, we we just really look to work with a lot of people on the whole pyramid. Dan, Dan, did you have a question, not a statement? No, actually, I should have lowered my hand. Sorry. Neil, question, not statement. No, it's a mute. Neil, you're muted. Yeah. I apologize. Sorry. I see that um, you're oh. you're treating the plastic as as a fuel, and therefore you want it as clean as possible and homogeneous as homogeneous as possible. <clears throat> what about uh, legislation requirements that uh, the nasty things that Paul has mentioned and um, uh, are eliminated? Um, isn't that the challenge of, of the industry to produce something that doesn't kill people? So uh, <clears throat> how would you react uh, to, uh, uh, to um, uh, excuse me, I, I really don't have a question because I, I would like to know if, uh, if this is something you're thinking about as far as working with environmentalists to get the nasty, dangerous things out of plastic, or I, I'm a layperson in this, does plastic not become plastic if you take those things out of it? Yeah, so this is a, a welcome discussion because we're working to set our specification for keeping all of that out. Mm -hmm. And so we're working real closely with people who make those absorbents to, to pull it out. And so we haven't finalized the spec, so it's, it's, it's a good time to have that discussion. Set that, yeah. So I to, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. I, I wanted to go back to the business just for a second. I, is the Synergy business to sell these systems to, to like municipalities and MERS and people like that? Um, it's it's two pronged to both sell because there's sure. entrepreneurs out there that, that want to make an impact. And then uh, largely it's running our own operations. Uh, initially, we want to show have two or three um, sites that show how to run it and make sure that it's done right and it's done safely. And then so, we uh, sort of like the market will dictate how much of that ratio is sold versus we're operating. So I realize there's some variables here. I can't elaborate on all of them, but if I were to buy this system from you, mm -hmm. what kind of daily th throughput am I going to need to pencil it out for myself? Um, so our system, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what our systems produce. So we're about 220 gallons of liquid. Um, so that could be primarily py pyrolysis oil or a mix, but, um, uh, that pencils out real well. So if you have two modules, which is about 10 tons per day, uh, that pencils out real nicely for like a three to four year payback. Which is far, far faster payback than than solar, um, especially solar in the early days and even now solar. Am but I going to want? Am I going to want a guaranteed throughput to to feel good about buying the system? <laughs> yes, you are. You absolutely <laughs> want to. And and we actually uh, we're we're getting our performance uh, insurance right now to to help you with that and help us with that. And make sure that you get that throughput. Yeah. Where am I going to get the throughput from? Oh, you mean the the feedstock? No, the the plastic, the the feedstock. Yeah, yeah, the the plastic feedstock. So yeah, it's it's there's we have I and mean, everybody in the room here we have a fairly good sense of how much post consumer waste is out there at these different places. Um, the, it's there's debates on it, but it's it's approximately the same amount of post industrial waste. So, um, like I said, there's there we would like to, to start out with mostly post-industrial waste, and then and then bring the mix up with post-consumer as we can implement the absorbance and make sure it's clean. So, how much am I going to want to have guaranteed 
need to satisfy my banker that I can buy your system. Um, how much? What do, you, what do you mean by how much? To, to pencil it out. How much output? So, In, you, so, so the input. rule of thumb on our systems are uh, one are kilogram. How much it would cost to capitalize the system? You're talking about cost or? No, I'm looking at the amount of input that I need. Yeah, so, so rule of thumb, one kilogram processed by one kilowatt hour of energy produces just shy of a, a one liter of fuel or one liter of oil. And the oil is, the oils are worth around, are you with $3, $3 to $13 a, a gallon? Uh, so let's call it three for now. Um, yeah, and, and and about 220 gallons per ton. Okay. Um, yeah, that, but that that one one one's a good good rule of thumb. One one kilogram, one kilowatt hour, one liter. And I'd like to get at least 10 liters of oil, right? For, for every 10 kilograms. Right. Yeah. So I guess we'll wrap it up with one more question, uh, Mary Lou. Well, I don't know that I have the most important question, but uh, how many times, if I have a, a transfer station like Berkeley's and it gets 400 tons a day, mm -hmm. uh, could I, how many tons a day do you suppose, I can, first of all, you're going to need, uh, if you're doing post-consumer plastic, you're going to need some sorting done before you can say that you've got the fuel that you need. So first of all, the plastics have to be separated from everything else, and then they have to be sorted into the correct, um, you know, polymer numbers or what, the correct numbers, and then it can become input for you. So if I have a 400 ton per day garbage transfer station, how many tons a day can I expect to deliver to you of sorted uh, input that you need? Yeah, so that's um, those are pretty reasonable. Like mid-sized cities, like some of the cities up here in North Bay, are, are similar to those numbers actually. And uh, somewhere around, um, so it depends on how much of that is plastic and what kind of plastic. But but in, if you're looking at hundreds of hundreds of tons per day of recyclable material, we're looking at being able to do around forty tons per day of that in our system. But most of that will want, of course, to be mechanically recycled. And some of that will be like threes, PVC, but it's not a huge percent, but we won't want to touch those. Um, and six sevens, right now we don't want to do six sevens. Later we'll do sixes. So you're going to need post-industrial feedstock. So, um, or yes, absolutely, strap. yes, absolutely. And and that will you know will be able to do near 100 percent of those that we identify as two four fives, um, but yeah, I, to answer your question, I guess I answered as it's around 10 percent, 40 tons per day at a 400 ton per day site. Yeah, that's kind of like what we're looking at up here. John, can I just get on the record? Uh, Brian talked about a, a typical system might be two modules. Can you put a round price on what that would cost, Brian? I know you're not at scale right now, but yeah, um, so the the modules maybe two to three million dollars each, but then there's depending on where it's going and the the tanks and piping around that. Um, that that would depend. So it's pretty low cost relative to some of these other plants. The smallest uh, traditional pyrolysis plants are you know around fifty million dollars to start, and we can do um, for around ten million dollars we can do uh, fifteen to twenty tons per day. Which, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Interesting. Again, like if you do the math. Separated clean, of clean, of clean input. Yeah, what, the labor costs involved in, in the sorting has probably not been figured out. You, are you yeah, going to so, mechanically or what? I mean, yeah, I don't understand the sorting process. Yeah, so the, the post-industrial, um, that's fairly straightforward. In fact, the, the version is so important for the landfill guys that they're willing largely to transport the post-industrial for us to get help their diversion numbers. So that's that's separate. The more challenging, of course, the post-consumer, 
the post consumer is a lot more work to sort and everything. So we're that's not our world. We're working with partners that like Amp Robotics, for example. They they have robotics that that sort. Um, there's another Vortex product that's out that that sucks the bags out very early on. That thing was that was just released two weeks ago. That technology is better at pulling the, the bags and films. Um, Cyclics, they've been around for a very long time. Um, they're trying to figure out a business model using GE technology to sort. So there's a lot of different groups out there working hard on sort. And let's like the other end of the oceans, there's a lot of people working on collecting ocean plastics, which is mostly polypropylene. We just work with those and collaborate with them. We don't do that sorting ourselves. But it looks like to answer questions on the, the the cost of that, we're looking at paying somewhere between fifty and one hundred fifty dollars per ton for sorted plastic. Whereas people like post industrial, they may pay us that amount. Um, so it might net out to zero. That helps the business case. But um, yeah, some places places will have to pay a lot to get that sorted. Well, Brian, I'm going to thank you for again for for being willing to, to show up and make your case. Um, it's been very interesting. I don't know that we covered all the bases or answered all the questions, but we got a, a good feel for what you're doing. And you know, we've, we'd like to look at the data and we'd like to see the the, the thing live when or if Nick or ever resumes doing tours. So again, I would really like to collaborate more on setting some of these definitions too. I, I really appreciate it. Well, we're, we're, we're all available. Oh, I can send you some definitions. <laughs> we have definitions. Yep. We have definitions. So, so with that, I'm going to adjourn tonight's WAC show. We do this the second Tuesday of every month, starting at 5:30. Uh, we'll find something equally interesting to talk about next month. I'm not sure what it is yet. So, again, thank you all for coming. Thank you again, Paul, for joining us from Aruba. Um, and again, we'll see you all next month. Thanks, Paul. Thank, thank you, Paul. Thank you. Bye, bye, everybody. Bye, bye. Thank Everyone. you. Thank you, Brian. Cheers. Bye.